So welcome everybody to another episode of Your Spiritual Journey. This is Dr. Bob Dove, and this is the space and the place where we discuss some critical matters to your spirit and to your soul. And I just want to send out a reminder that to keep us going, it would be nice if you would like us, subscribe, uh, leave your comments, all of those things are helpful. Maybe even subscribe to us on Patreon. Today's guest is somebody pretty special to me because it's my sister and my only sister. <laughs> this is uh, Patricia Holly Dove. And if you shorten that, you get Ph.D., and she likes to say that that's because her mother wanted her to have her Ph.D. before she got married. So she's had it from birth. In her 73 years, she's lived on, lived on both coasts, uh, got her MBA by age 32, her RN by age 60, and has always been spiritually connected. Her latest indulgences include listening to Friar Richard Rohr and bringing the spiritual into everyday life in order to become a better person. And that's all she wanted me to say about her. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and turn the mic over to Holly uh, to hear about her spiritual journey from childhood till the present day. Holly, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob. And I feel truly honored that you would ask me to be a guest on your show when I have listened to the other podcast and been so enthralled and amazed at the wonderful journeys that all these other folks have had um, to come to their, their current now place in spirituality. Um, I did have, at the end of my intro for you to read, I did say you could add anything you wanted if you wanted to. So um, I do realize that some of the my past that I might relate may not match your recollection or understanding of the, the past that we may have shared when we grew up together. But there again, it's all about perspective. So... Um, Speaking of perspective, I know everybody's got their own, and I would like to just offer you that no matter how you push the envelope, it'll still be stationary. So it is a matter of perspective. So no matter what I say today, some things may resonate with you and others may not. Take what works and leave the rest behind, but that's like with, with anyone's journey. Not everybody can necessarily relate. Well, that that very bad dad joke about stationery and envelopes uh, did resonate with me. So okay. go ahead. We did have the same dad. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you like me to start? Well, the beginning is always good. Uh, I know I that born. you... I know that you had some childhood experiences with uh, some spirit guides and some orbs and things, so uh, maybe start with that. Okay, well, I'm, I was born Long Island, New York, and uh, then the family moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh, kind of grew up in a log cabin. Church was never really... A big part of our lives, uh, we did occasionally go to church so that the parents could get away from us kids for a little while, like a babysitting respite for them. Um, and then when we moved out to the log cabin out in Plum Borough, um, I would go to church occasionally with uh, friends of mine who lived on the same street who would be going and ask if I'd want to tag along. But what I found was one of the Baptist churches we went to, and this is nothing to say about Baptist, it was just this particular church. Uh, one of the ladies would get up on stage, ranting and raving, crying, pulling her hair out, pacing back and forth across the stage about being washed in the blood of the Lamb of the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved from our sins. And I went home that day, I said, do I have to go back there? I think there's something wrong with her. 
<laughs> <laughs> and I was told, no, I, I did not have to go there or anywhere if I didn't want to. It was up to me to decide what kind of spiritual or religious experience I wanted. And I'm very grateful for that. A year later, that church closed down because that lady and the pastor was having an affair, and he was a married pastor, and oh, lots of scandal. Anyway, it did point out to me early on how our human condition um, can affect our belief in religion. So I was never really a religious person, but always spiritual. The log cabin that we grew up in um, out in Plum Borough had lots of trees. We had a grove and um, I don't know if it was two or three acres we were on out in the woods, out in the, the boondocks and near a farm and um, at the end of a road on a cul-de-sac kind of thing. And I loved that area. I really felt uh, bathed in forest spirituality out there. I loved being outside. Now, there was a lot of turmoil growing up because of the unhappiness of the people who were in charge, and their unhappiness is from their childhood. They brought with them and never quite got over. But I always had this sense of just give it time. Just give it time. Wait till you get out on your own. You can do life your own way. And I had visitations of you know, that twilight area of sleep where you're not really awake, you're not really asleep. I had a vision of a guardian angel who looked like in the Wizard of Oz, remember the good witch of the East who comes down with her star wand all dressed in white crinoline and sparkles and, and halos and, and she comes down in a bubble of white light. Well, she visited me in my attic bedroom and put me on her lap and held me with a feeling of love that I don't recall ever having had earlier. And I think at this point I was six years old. Um, and she told me that this situation was temporary. I just needed to bide my time. Things would change and get better. She told me I would have an MBA, I would be married and divorced, I would have my own business and it would go bankrupt, but through all these difficulties, I was not to despair because I was being protected. I didn't know what an MBA was. I sort of knew what divorce was because both parents had been through divorce in order to come together. Uh, I didn't know what bankruptcy meant. You know, it, these were things beyond my understanding. I just was basking in her love and being on her lap and feeling so assured that everything was going to be okay. Now, there's there was no guidance within the home that this was appropriate to talk about or that it was something that I could share with anyone at the time. So I didn't. And part of the reason was because several times when I'd be traveling in the car with my family, I would tell them, don't take that road. There's an accident down there. Don't go down that way. We'll be held up. And I'm, I'm young. I'm like five, six, seven years old when I'm telling them this. And they would uh, look at me and say, well, how do you know that? You haven't listened to the news. You don't know what's going on. Sure enough, we'd go down that road and there would be an accident there. So things like that happened. Um, Friday the 13th has always been lucky for me. In school, when teachers would schedule a test on Friday the 13th, I wouldn't study because I knew it wouldn't happen, that we would have the weekend to study and then we'd have it on Monday. So I wouldn't study. And sure enough, we wouldn't have the test. So I was always sort of aware of what was going to happen before it would happen. Um, but I, I got to the point where I couldn't tell anybody because, <clears throat> well, at one point I got spanked for it. They said I was frightening them, so not to say things like that. My stepmother, 
was very into Edgar Casey, and she believed in ghosts. We always watched the paranormal programs on television, and that that all kind of anchored my belief in spirituality, not God, not religious stuff, but that there were things beyond our physical humanness, um, our our three-dimensional world <clears throat> that was happening that felt very real for me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So anyway, the, the uh, progression from um, childhood experiences, um, I never really felt like a human being. I never felt like I belonged. I didn't feel like I was part of um, the kids at school or part of the human race. I just felt very odd around people. Of course, I didn't trust them. I had eight different homes by the time I was five because the parents were, were in process of divorce and reuniting and trying to coalesce five of us kids together. So I was in foster homes, I was in orphanages, I was with um, relatives for a while, and every home had their own way of doing things. They had their own rules. Um, some of them would let me go in the refrigerator, some of them would not. And, you know, so every time I went somewhere new, it was a new set of rules. And some of them were not very nice. I got hit a lot. So I learned that the only constant in my life was me, was, was what I could count on. Those eight different homes happened before I was five years old. By the time I was five years old, uh, my father um, got together um, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, brought those kids together, and we were trying to be a family unit. Uh, a year or so later, we moved out into Plum Borough, the log cabin, where is where I really felt like a part of the world. I felt spiritually connected to the forest and the tree. Not so much human beings. I still didn't trust anybody. So high school was difficult. I did not go to a church. I did not have communion with God, per se. I didn't pray. However, I had a very strong spiritual connection out in the woods. We, in our grove, or, or I would go off to the, the farmer's cornfield next door and hide out in the cornfield. And it was just a, a wonderful sense of being wrapped in the love of nature. Um, so I always felt like things are going to get better with time. And my stepmother used to say, time heals all wounds. So whatever you're going through now, you're not happy with, just give it time. It'll change. Everything changes. Anyway, I have my brother Bob and my brother Rick to thank very much for helping me escape that house in Plumborough when I graduated high school. They found me an apartment downtown where they could watch me, keep an eye on me. Uh, brother Rick got me a job where he worked. Brother Bob helped me get into Pitt University uh, to take evening courses and get an apartment. They watched over me, and they were very protective spirits, helping me make the transition from a very sheltered childhood that was full of turmoil and chaos out into the real world, which still scared the hell out of me. But nonetheless... They helped me have that foundational support to get off on my own. And it was, it was just a godsend. I chose them to be in my <laughs> life, and I'm so blessed that I did. So Bob introduced me to my future husband, and um, he had... I apologize um, for that, by the way. Oh, no, <laughs> I don't regret it at all. George was a safe place for me to grow up. We got married when I was 19. I think he was 21 or something. 
uh, we moved to New York because he got a, a job and a, and a uh, scholarship up in uh, Manhattan. I went to Hunter College up there to get my BS in chemistry. It was the right timing because it was the last year that I could get in as a citizen, quote unquote, citizen of New York and pay no tuition. I got my college BS degree in chemistry free. Wow. I had to pay books and supplies, that sort of thing. Yeah. But it was the right timing. So thank you for introducing me to George. <laughs> okay. And George and I got along. Now, he was not spiritual. He was very logical, intelligent, but also an alcoholic, which I had no idea what that was. I didn't even recognize it when we were together. But I just knew that, again, this was a a um, plateau in my growth. This was not the be-all, end-all. I knew we would not be together for a long time, and I, I knew because my guardian angel told me I'd be married and divorced. Um, I knew that um, he and I didn't really communicate on a relationship level. We did talk about politics and science, which was a good outlet. We raised pot plants together, and we had um, a nice little apartment together. I, however, was working while going to get my BS degree, and I was supporting us. He had a stipend for his um, while he was getting his working on his um, PhD, but it didn't cover our necessities. My income was covering our necessities, so I basically supported him. However, he did make a contribution. He cooked a great spaghetti sauce, and he taught me how to make it. And I use it to this day. It's wonderful. He was a good cook. At any rate, during that time when I was going to college and working, uh, I was working three quarters of the time, going to college full time, hardly saw George for a couple of years. We would pass like ships in the night. Um, we were okay roommates. Um but once I graduated and he was, uh, well, it's a year before I graduated and he was um, getting ready to get through his um, uh, PhD at Brandeis University in Massachusetts. We realized we didn't know each other very well. We'd been married about nine years at that point. And I said to him, you know, we have to decide if we're gonna stay together, have children, or get divorced. And he looked at me and he said, well, why would you want to get divorced? I said, well, you're having an affair. I don't love you. There's no sense for us staying together. <laughs> and he said, well, no, no, let's not decide that. Let's do a two month vacation together. We'll take leave of absences from work and school. We'll go cross country, go visit all our national parks, which is what we like to do because we used to hike in the White Mountains in Massachusetts and Vermont. And um, then at the end of that, we'll decide what we want to do. And I said, yeah, that sounds great because I wanted to visit all these states. So we did that. During that trip, we didn't see every state in the union, but I think we only missed five of them. We camped at KOA campgrounds, we camped at national parks, hiked in the woods, off trail, um, and it was marvelous. But this is where I got in touch with my authentic self. This is where, when we were out in the woods, he'd be drinking his beer, getting sloshed, and I would go off in the woods by myself and just marvel and be so astounded by the beauty and the authenticity in in the woods, I was just I just felt one with nature out there. To the point where one day when we were hiking off trail, there's nobody around. Uh, we came up to this cliff, and he said, "Oh, I guess we have to turn around." I said, "No, we're going over this cliff," and he said, "We can't. It's straight up." I said, "Yes, we can." I led the way hand-holding onto different little trees and plants and found footholds. And I climbed up that cliff in two minutes. It was a miracle because I had been afraid of heights. 
he he had a hard time getting up there behind me. But I felt like I was being pulled and pushed up that mountain by unforeseen forces. And I just felt so loved, so protected, so guided that I knew there's something more to this life than just being human. Anyway, at the end of that trip, I decided we were getting divorced. He decided we were staying together. <laughs> we got divorced. We got divorced. I won. It was a, a quote-unquote friendly divorce. It was no fault uncontested in the state of New York. And I gave him everything. We even split the pot and the wine. So it was a friendly split up. And about six months after the divorce was finalized, he called me. He said, let me take you out to a, for a drink because I was going to leave for California. This We were still in New York at the time. And um, he told me over a drink, he said, you know, the best thing we have done as a couple, and for me, referring to himself, was our divorce. Thank you for insisting on the divorce. And he said the next best thing we did for ourselves and for me, as a, he's talking again, talking about himself, was that we got married. He said, I've really grown a lot since knowing you. And it was validation that for me, there's nothing to regret in life. Every, everything, no matter what kind of turmoil you're going through, a challenge I was going through, it all led to a positive outcome. And that helped me want to go on to continue with uh, whatever journey or path I was on. Anyway, I still wasn't acknowledging God. I wasn't acknowledging religion. But I was starting to sort of get a handle on this spirituality thing and how I could trust the universe. I could trust some innate knowledge or wisdom within me to assist me with the right timing, with the right place to be. Um, friends of ours that we had had when we were married agreed to share custody of us once we got divorced. They would see me <laughs> on um, uh, Saturday night, but they'd see him Friday night before. So Saturday night, I get the full rundown and report of what he was up to. <laughs> the next week, they would get the report on. He'd get the report on me. But uh, she, um, a friend of mine, Madeline, introduced me to Est. And when I took Est, I just went with the flow. I did not fight them. They were coming across very authoritarian and all this. I didn't fight it like some people did, and they got kicked out. But what Est helped me realize was to trust my inner sense of guidance, to get in touch with that inner awareness and allow that to come out and, and to ask for whatever it was I needed or wanted to, to go ahead and ask for it because all the answers were within me. I loved Est. I still think it was a good idea. There are a lot of people who had bad experiences with it, but the one-on-one -on -one types of readings we did for each other, I came away realizing that I had a gift for assisting others and becoming aware of what was really going on for them. Anyway, after leaving George, I went out to California, and um, there my brother Rick and his wife Cece helped me get established. Um, I did a couple of things out there. At this point, I had my BS degree in chemistry, hadn't got a clue what I wanted, couldn't get hired by any, um, by any companies because I was still holding on to childhood anger, and it was coming out in all sorts of ways, and I, I didn't understand it, didn't know why, but when I moved across country to California, I took three months to do it, camping out everywhere, sleeping in my cars, basically homeless, 
uh, I just packed my car with my books, paintings, and clothes and, and took off. Um, I wanted to truly find myself. And during that period of time, I was not grounded. I truly felt I was floating above the ground. I couldn't relate to being a human being. I didn't feel... It was almost like an out-of-body experience for three months. And it wasn't until I saw Rick when I got to San Francisco that I broke down in tears and cried. I cried for an hour. It was like all of a sudden he brought me back down to ground. And um, he helped me again find a foundation that I could then start building a life on. Again, I feel very blessed that he's been in my life. So California was a wonderful experience. I was there for about 20 years. Oh, my divorce happened when I was 30. So um, the California experience, I grew up a lot, had my own business, got a real estate broker's license, sold real estate, made some good money, had some wonderful experiences metaphysically, got in touch with... Um, an awareness that when I would ask the universe for an answer or guidance, within a day or two, I got answers. The phone would ring with the right resource I needed. Or an example would happen, like um, I was very discouraged. I was living with a man at the time and very discouraged about our relationship. And I asked the universe, please give me a sign that you're with me, <laughs> that you're helping me, because I feel pretty much alone right now. And it did. I had two signs in one day, near accidents on the highways, that missed my back bumper by inches. By the time the second one was done, I said, okay, I don't need any more sign. I believe you. Thank you for being with me. <laughs> Thank you for, for protecting me and guiding me. I know you're here. Thank you. Also, during that time, I attended Center for Spiritual Living and Unity Church. Um, and you know, it was, uh, I'm sorry, primarily Unity Church. It was Center for Spiritual Living came along when I moved to Arizona. I was in California still, did Unity Church. And, of course, um, uh, Baker Eddy was the, the precursor to um, the film wars that started Unity. And their quote-unquote new thought way of thinking really resonated with me. And it asked fit right into it. Everything S did, they were doing. Anyway, my spirituality was growing. My awareness of the universe having a role in my life was growing. I still didn't believe in God because God, you see, was a male figure from everything I was taught. I had no trust for men or males, although my brothers were wonderful examples of just the opposite. So one night before I went to bed, I had a dream. But before I, I went to sleep, I put it out to the universe. I said, okay, I need to understand why I'm afraid of men Granted, I'm afraid of everybody, but why am I so afraid of men, even though I was living with a guy? I, I didn't understand what was going on. Now, I, you know, I hear the, the voices in my head, pros and cons, debating different things, and, and all that chatter that we have going on in our minds all the time. And I, I put it out to the universe. Who are these people in my brain? What, what are they talking about? And why do I have them there? So I had a dream about a huge conference table in a room and there were all these people sitting around the conference table called my quote unquote board of directors. And in the corner was this huge phallic symbol. And I'm looking around the room and each one is talking all at the same time. They've all got different opinions and ideas. And I'm looking at them, each one individually and I can't really see their faces. They're just, they're in the shape of people, but I can't make out faces, but they all present as male figures. And then I look over and there's this phallic symbol in the corner 
huge floor to ceiling. And it's like, oh, this is a male dominated boardroom and I don't like it. So I just said, okay, you all be quiet. You're going to hear from me now. <laughs> I'm not male. I'm female. At least right now I'm female. And I don't want you all making decisions for my life. Everything disappeared. And it was like I, I finally took charge. Everything got quiet. All the faces disappeared. All the people disappeared in the room. The phallic symbol went away too. <laughs> and it was like, okay, now I'm alone. Okay. And then the dream ended. But from that day on, I felt a lightness and a freedom that that just woke me up to like, okay, now I can really be me. Shortly after that, I left my paramour, who I'd been living with for two and a half years. He and I completed each other's sentences. We were truly each other's soulmates. But as gorgeous as he was and as nice as he was and how well we got along, he was a player and I wasn't. And I didn't want to be in a, in a marriage situation. I didn't need a lifetime person anymore in my life. I wanted to be on my own. So at any rate, I moved out to Arizona. He went on his merry way. And um, my life in Arizona was phenomenal. Lots of metaphysical experiences, lots of right timing. Um, I manifested what I wanted as far as move uh, to Prescott and then move out to Scottsdale and Tempe, Arizona and, and be able to be wherever I needed to be to get my RN, to get the job in the on the Indian reservation as a nurse, uh, to be fired from there, <laughs> and to go on with um, transitioning out of nursing practice, which I was only in for about two and a half years, and then becoming a spiritual leader in Lake Havasu. I did full moon drumming circles. I put on the mind, body, spirit fairs. I did rune readings, Reiki uh, sessions with people. I cleared houses of supposed ghosts or hauntings that they the family was experiencing. Um, and I, I wrote a, a small booklet called Seeing Things. I don't know if you can see that. Yes. Um, and that, okay. that picture was taken at one of my full moon drum circles. Of course, it's at night. And... Um, my cameras, I went through three of them while I was doing the full moon drum circles over the course of a couple of years. My camera would capture these orbs. It wasn't raining. It doesn't rain in Havasu. There was no moisture in the air. No bugs either because it gets too hot. They get fried during the day. These orbs are spirits that were invited to join us at the drum circles. Mm -hmm. And not only did I capture them on my camera, and by the way, they're on my Facebook page if you'd like to witness them, but others who brought their cameras captured orbs on their cameras. At one full moon drum circle, there was a Native American who came with his wife and child. And as I took a picture in his direction, he was surrounded by the silhouette of a white male figure. And I showed him the picture. And he said, oh, yes, that's my grandfather. He's always with me. <laughs> and it was just miraculous, the metaphysical experiences I've had while being in Havasu. I moved out here in uh, 2010, been here ever since. When I first moved out, I discovered nine different vortex sites, created a vortex map, um, sold it to cover my initial costs, and then gave it away free to our Go Lake Havasu um, tourist uh, in information website. And they have since brought in somebody from Sedona who has an engineering physics background, and he, he created a different map for them on, on vortex sites, which I don't agree with, but that's okay. 
<laughs> let me let me stop you for a minute, story. Holly. Uh, okay. Because not everybody in our audience is familiar with what a drum circle is. So what what happens and why bother doing a drum circle? Okay, my philosophy. Uh, going into a drum circle is not purely Native American. And it has nothing to do with negativity at all. The purpose of my drumming circles was for people to gather around in a circle. And I had a uh, singing bowl, which was a, a crystalline bowl in the key of A, which opens up the third eye, uh, that I would play. I'd put a uh, it was a big, huge one. It was about an 18-inch diameter one. And I'd put a candle in the center. So we wouldn't have a fire, per se, like a campfire. We would have the candle glowing inside the singing bowl. And that would be our only light out there. People would sit around a circle of that. And sometimes I had as many as 30 people. Sometimes I had as few as two others. So it depended on the time of year and what was going on. Mm -hmm. The purpose was for people to bring their drums, typically a rim drum or something small, not snares and electronic stuff. And we would, I would go around the circle, smudge everyone with sage, allow them to open up to their spirit guides, their authentic selves, and to become aware of who they are with their innate wisdom internally. This had nothing to do with religion. All people were invited. Any age group um, was invited. The only thing I did curtail were pets because pets can bark at each other. They have to go to the bathroom. They want to run around. They want to chase the rabbits or whatever. Uh, so I wanted people to be able to focus on their own internal selves and their connection with spirit. So the way I handled drum circles was to encourage people to get in touch with their authentic self. So somewhere at some point in time, you got introduced to the concept of drum circles uh, because I, I recently interviewed uh, a couple who run a, a retreat, a Reiki retreat, and they talked about getting introduced to drum circles and then uh instituting drum circles and then getting trained uh, after they started doing them <laughs> then they went out and got some real training and uh and how to do drum circles uh and i've participated in a drum circle with them uh so what when and where and how did did you get introduced to this whole concept during the time that i was in california i attended uh, retreats and um, one of them was in Ben Lomond um, and at the Ben Lomond retreat they had a hall and they were performing a drum circle and everybody was invited well there must have been 50 of us in a big circle inside this hall now there was no campfire in the center obviously and the lights were on it was at night and they had drums for everybody to, most people brought their own, but for those of us who didn't have a drum at the time, they handed them out. So I used one of their rim drums. And as we were drumming, I heard chanting. Now, I have been clairaudient in the past. I have heard voices in the past that seem to come from over my left shoulder. Um... But here there was chanting out in front of me, surround sound everywhere. So I open my eyes and I'm looking around. No one's mouth is moving. There's nobody chanting in that room. But it was Native American chanting and it went on and on for the entire duration of the drum circle. It wasn't just a couple of minutes. That's what introduced me to drum circles. And that's when I was absolutely positive I needed to do that. But while I lived in California, there was a fella named Crow Man. He and his wife became friends of mine and my paramour. We would, we would go to drum circles with them. He would lead the drum circles out at Seabright Beach uh, in Santa Cruz. 
And uh, so I kind of learned the technique from him. And um, he always wanted food at the drum circles because he, he enjoyed having his refreshment there. Um, but I got into arguments with him because he was very male-oriented. <laughs> anyway, male-oriented meaning not acknowledging the feminine. And um, so I got to the point where I really didn't like the way he did his drum circles. Too much male dogma. So okay. even though I respected him and I, I really enjoyed the company of he and his wife, I went off on my own when I uh, came out to Arizona and yeah. developed my yeah. own drum circle. Okay. Now, also, I want to tell you, uh, in uh, California, I got introduced to heart math. You've talked about heart math before. Uh -huh. And I got introduced to heart math and went to a couple of their workshops and thoroughly enjoyed and appreciated the science behind what they were doing. Okay. So we're, we're getting close to the end. And I know that there is uh, a photograph that you wanted to, to show here on YouTube. Uh, yes. Our radio listeners won't be able to see this. Okay. okay, so this photograph was taken when I was in California. Um, living with my paramour and I was feeling kind of alone and I went to a psychic fair um, and they had a Karelian photographer there and what she did was take pictures of people sitting in a chair with their hands on some kind of electrode pads and she would snap their photograph and a couple days later they'd pick it up and it would show their aura and she would interpret their aura reading most of the examples she showed me had orange or red or a yellowish orange swatch all around the, the basic picture. They were just awash with orange and red. And I thought, okay, hmm, I'm not sure I want to waste my money on that, but I sat for the photograph. And at that time, I was talking to the universe saying, if I have spirit guides, I'd like them to show up. I'd like and they did. <laughs> and this is a picture of it. I'm going to try and get it on here. Um, okay. You need to lift it higher. If you can see in the upper. Okay, a little higher. Okay. All right, there it is. Now okay. a little lower. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's this. It's this. Am I? All right. So it's over here where the red spot is. Uh, yeah. It was interpreted that that was my deceased child. I had had a miscarriage with my paramour. Ah. Uh, I'm sorry. I had a miscarriage when I was married um, uh, to George. And that was supposed to be the soul or spirit of that miscarriage. It, okay. It was apparently a little girl. Yeah. And then this is a teacher over here. Uh, the, the purple across my throat is my intuitive guide and then the yellow and gold swatches were my two primary spirit guides one was named emily and one was named uh, norman so they were in their 20s and very playful spirits which is why it took me a long time to grow up i think <laughs> okay but she gave me that photograph for free as well as 10 others of different sizes because she said that's the first time that's ever happened with her Karelian photography to catch the spirit guides. Yeah. So. Okay. So at this point in every podcast, uh, I asked my interviewee to leave the audience with some words of wisdom, or if you're not feeling very wise, just any old words that you'd like to leave them with. So this is your opportunity to, uh, to do so. Well, words of wisdom is follow your own awareness. And if you don't have that or feel you don't have it yet, be contemplative. If you don't know how to meditate, just sit quietly in nature. Just listen to the environment. Be in the moment. Listen to the environment. But I wanted to read you a little bit from the Seeing Things booklet that I, I, I self-published. That means on my own printer. <laughs> yeah. 
the, uh, the four A's define what I consider love to be, and they are aware, acknowledge, accept, and appreciate. Because when you walk into a room and you sh are aware of a person in front of you, when you acknowledge them by saying hello, smiling, or meeting their gaze, when you accept what they have to say, that that is their, they're speaking from their own self, and then you show some appreciation for the fact that they shared that with you, that is an expression of love. So love isn't lust, it isn't all the incredible flood of emotions that come over anyone from necessarily being with a certain person. It is being in the moment. If it's with a tree in the forest, be aware of that tree, acknowledge it, accept it, and appreciate it. Prayers of gratitude are, for me, have been the most gratifying because it has brought serendipity, harmony, and synchronicity into my life. I am where I am today because of the harmony and synchronicity that has come from forgiveness and gratitude. Highly recommend them. I'll leave you with this last thought. Atheism is a nonprofit organization. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and with that, audience, take what resonates with you and incorporate it into your way of being and put the rest of it on the shelf to pull down when you're ready to accept it. Until next time, this has been your spiritual journey.